So today's lecture is a couple minutes longer than yesterday's. And I think all of you have been introduced to me and to the topic. So if you don't mind, I think I'm going to dive right in. And I'm going to start today with a brief reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 1 through 5 and 14 to 15. The saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you so that if I'm delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. I want us to reflect a little bit today on what Paul means when he says to Timothy that the church is the pillar and the bulwark of the truth. On Tuesday, we talked about the sending of the Spirit and the spread of Christian doctrine during early church history. Yesterday, we treated creeds, canons, church councils, and the best-known contests over biblical exegesis in the post-canonical era. And today, it's time to tell the part of our story most of us know best, the part in which Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestants alike debated the relative authority of Scripture Tradition now spelled with a capital T and leaders of the church in the teaching of its doctrine to the faithful. I want to resume our story in the early 12th century for no one symbolized medieval disagreements over doctrine and their sources of authority more fully than the Frenchman Peter Abelard, who sic et non, which is Latin simply for yes and no, uh, published in about 1120, undermined the faith of many in the unified witness of the teachers of the church, posing 158 theological questions. He arrayed the church fathers on opposing sides of each of them, demonstrating clearly that they contradicted themselves and encouraging a dialectical search for the truth. Despite the errors many frequently decried in sic et non, it awakened earnest students to the problems that attend glib appeals to the tradition or the witness of the fathers and was placed much later on the index of forbidden books. In the meantime, it fueled the rise of orthodox, organized compilations of what were called in the Middle Ages sentences on scripture and tradition, culled from early church fathers. Learned commentaries upon the most famous of these sentences and summaries of doctrine by theologians eager to show that Christian faith coheres. The most influential of these were the four books of sentences by Bishop Peter Lombard, 1155 to 1157. An Italian serving in Paris, which became the leading dogmatic textbook in Europe and inspired scores of commentaries in centuries to come. Many now yearned for a stable and reliable way to inculcate the word by the Spirit in the church. There are always some who face ambiguity with ease, keeping faith with God and neighbor in the midst of uncertainty, conflict, and mystery. But most of us want guidance. And by the 13th century, many Westerners attained it in a resolution regarding the relationship between scripture, tradition, and the church, close to that of Thomas Aquinas, for whom orthodox tradition, determined by the church, was a source of authority analogous to scripture. It was varied, to be sure, and shaped doctrine indirectly through the dictates of popes, church councils, and other organs of the Catholic magisterium, which by now stood apart from the bishops of the Eastern churches, who favored a somewhat more conciliar, 
That word's going to keep coming up. Remember, it just has to do with things that come from councils, church councils. The Easterners favored a somewhat more conciliar, less papal understanding of the promulgation of doctrine. In the main, it was used to guide biblical exegesis, tradition that is, but it guided nonetheless for Thomas as it harmonized conflicts under the aegis of the church in favor of Roman Catholic orthodoxy. As Thomas wrote famously in his Summa Theologiae, which he wrote in the 1260s and 1270s, doctrine is especially based upon arguments from authority inasmuch as its principles are obtained by revelation. Thus, we ought to believe on the authority of those to whom the revelation has been made. He insisted that such conduits of special revelation ought not to say about God anything which is not found in Holy Scripture either explicitly or implicitly, and that or implicitly, of course, matters a lot in these arguments. But he claimed that the bishops usually followed this rule. In every council of the church, he said, a symbol of faith has been drawn up to meet some prevalent error condemned in the council at that time. Hence, subsequent councils are not to be described as making a new symbol of faith, but what was implicitly contained in the first symbol was explained by some addition directed against rising heresies, unquote. Church teaching explicated the deposit of the faith, for him. And even unwritten tradition played a part in this affair, though always under the tutelage of apostolic heirs in the Catholic Church. Quote, the apostles, led by the inward instinct of the Holy Ghost, handed down to the churches certain instructions which they did not put in writing, but which have been ordained in accordance with the observance of the church as practiced by the faithful as time went on, unquote. Thus, tradition for Thomas always functioned as a necessary apostolic guide to revelation when deployed by those entrusted with the teaching of the church. God's Spirit gave the word through the bishops of the Catholic Church who inculcated Scripture in accordance with tradition. By the late Middle Ages, even critics of the papacy and pillars of conciliarism rooted their positions in the soil of tradition. Academics disagreed about the relative authority of popes, church councils, Christian princes, canon law, and the doctors of the church in discerning church tradition. Some questioned whether anything not based on the Bible was essential to salvation. During the Western Papal Schism, 1378 to about 1417, many sought a more Episcopal approach to solving internal doctrinal disputes. And Episcopal just refers to the rule of bishops. Still, most parties involved laid claim to the past. Even those at the Council of Constance, 1414 to 1418, convened at the apex of conciliar dominion to put an end once and for all to the Western papal schism, because by then there were two popes and a third was on the merge, and they were all fighting over who was the real pope, and so you would, councils were required to solve the problem. But even then, at the apex of conciliar dominion, uh, people resorted to the Catholic faith, councils, and the fathers, condemning the English theologian John Wycliffe and the Czech or Bohemian theologian Jan Hus, who resisted their rendition of late medieval Catholicity. And they compelled future pontiffs, future popes, to profess their allegiance to orthodox tradition. This is the leaders of the Council of Constance who were uh, uh, valorizing the authority of church councils rather than popes in the teaching ministry of the church because this was necessary to solve the problems of the great Western papal schism were advocating uh, in support of their position a strong allegiance to tradition with a capital T. As long as I am in this fragile life, all future popes had to pledge, I will firmly believe and hold the Catholic faith according to the traditions of the apostles, of the general councils, and of other holy fathers, especially of the eight holy universal councils, 
There had been an eighth ecumenical council in the Western Church by this time in Constantinople, as well as of the general councils at the Lateran, Lyon, and Vienne. Furthermore, they had to say, I will preserve this faith unchanged to the last dot and will confirm, defend, and preach it to the point of death and the shedding of my blood, unquote. Thus, when Luther claimed not only that the papacy had erred, but that councils, canon law, and the mass itself were flawed, pandemonium ensued, tearing scabs from several wounds on the global body of Christ that had formed very slowly and had never quite healed. Luther's brief against the Catholic Church was leveled most loudly in the 95 Theses of 1517. Upset about the sale of indulgences in Germany to raise funds for Rome, he contended that this practice misconstrued Christian teaching on salvation by grace. But his case against the church's view of scripture and tradition would continue to develop over the next several years. At the Leipzig Disputation versus Johann Eck of Ingolstadt in 1519, he opposed the supremacy of popes and church councils. Then he published three treatises in 1520 against the tyranny of Rome over German-speaking Christians, against the Babylonian, as he called it, or Roman captivity of the church, and the freedom of the Christian to live for God without subservience to man-made rules. Before these tracts were released, Pope Leo X condemned him in a papal bull called Exurge Domine, published in 1520 which summarized his heresy in 41 doctrines and threatened to exclude him from the sacraments if he did not recant in 60 days. Luther burned the bull publicly six months later. He was excommunicated early in 1521 and commanded to appear before the emperor at Worms. In response to the Pope's condemnation of his views, he claimed to preach nothing new but asserted that the Bible had been muffled by the Curia, even by the Pope, and that Scripture alone, not the Roman magisterium, was infallible and determinative in matters of faith and practice. This is my answer to those also who accuse me of rejecting all the holy teachers of the church, Luther wrote. I do not reject them, but everyone indeed knows that at times they have erred, as men will, Therefore, I am ready to trust them only when they give me evidence for their opinions from Scripture, which has never erred. Scripture alone is the true Lord and master of all writings and doctrine on earth. Before Emperor Charles V, he added, with much fear and trembling, I might add, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the Scriptures or by clear reason, for I don't trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it's well known that they've often erred and contradicted themselves, I'm bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. This is standard fare today among heirs of Luther's doctrine, but in 1521, it made him an outlaw. Church officials at the Council of Trent, 1545 to 1563, soon circled the wagons protecting an inviolate, concatenated concept of the Catholic tradition. Following the example of the Orthodox Fathers, they decreed in an effort to repel Luther's teaching, the council accepts and venerates with a like feeling of piety and reverence both the contents of the Vulgate, the common Latin Bible that included the apocryphal books, both the contents of the Vulgate and traditions of faith and conduct as either directly spoken by Christ or dictated by the Holy Spirit, which have been preserved in unbroken sequence in the church. And if anyone should not accept the Vulgate and aforesaid traditions of the church, let him be anathema. Protestants were severed from the Roman Catholic Church. No one relying on his personal judgment, the council fathers continued, shall dare to interpret the sacred scriptures either by twisting its text to his individual meaning in opposition to that which has been and is held by Holy Mother Church, 
whose function is to pass judgment on the true meaning and interpretation of the sacred scriptures, or by giving it meanings contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers. Whoever acts contrary to this decision is to be publicly named by religious superiors and punished by the penalties prescribed by law. More than three centuries later, these strictures were confirmed at the First Vatican Council, 1869 and 1870. Supernatural revelation, its delegates explained, according to the belief of the universal church as declared by the Sacred Council of Trent, is contained in written books and unwritten traditions. And that meaning of Holy Scripture must be held to be the true one which Holy Mother Church held and holds." Unquote. Luther had not intended to disown the tradition. On the contrary, he thought his evangelical reformers had the best claim to rightful continuity with the past. And as I think you can tell this week, I'm hoping we're going to be like Luther, be scripture principle people who have good arguments to the effect that we hold the best claim to rightful continuity with the past. And we're happy to use the past when it comports well with scripture in the teaching ministries of our churches. But as they made use of what they came to call the scripture principle, they are the Protestants in this sentence, wielding God's word to weed and prune the tradition and revise Christian doctrine with their own exegesis, they accelerated the, the, the doctrinal diversity of Christendom and expanded the means by which the spirit was discerned at a rate unprecedented in history. The French reformer John Calvin in an address to King Francis I, prefaced to his institutes, did not at all doubt that his Reformation doctrine sounded new to Catholic critics, since to them both Christ himself and his gospel are new, it's a quote, but it clearly had the weight of Christian history on its side. All the fathers, he insisted in a hyperbolic flourish, all the fathers with one heart have abhorred and with one voice have detested the fact that God's holy word has been contaminated by the subtleties of sophists and involved in the squabbles of dialecticians. When they attempt nothing in life but to enshroud and obscure the simplicity of Scripture with endless contentions and worse than sophistic brawls, do they keep themselves within these borders? Calvin queried. If the fathers were now brought back to life, he concluded, they would surely sympathize with the reformers. Still, even high church Protestants subscribed to tradition only insofar as the latter followed scripture. As Richard Hooker, a high church Anglican Protestant, clarified in his Elizabethan Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, published in the 1590s, Lest, therefore, the name of tradition should be offensive, considering how far by some it is abused, we mean by traditions, ordinances made in the prime of Christian religion, in the apostolic age, established with that authority which Christ hath left his church for matters indifferent, and in that consideration requisite to be observed, till like authority see just and reasonable cause to alter them. Traditions were derived from the teaching of the apostles and revisable based upon the very same thing. Though for Anglicans like Hooker, only in rightly ordered ways by ecclesial officials. So he's not arguing for a super individualistic right of private judgment. He is arguing though for the supremacy of scripture for teaching ministry. Even the most radical Protestants interpreted the Bible with assistance from the past. But the Reformation raised some rather disconcerting questions. Did the church's rightful teachers ever get the Bible wrong? Did popes and councils err? And if they did, what should be done? As Protestantism spread, so did the spirit of reform, critical thinking, and revision of the church's teaching ministry that stemmed from the crises of the late Middle Ages, a term that had been coined Middle Ages, amid these European culture wars by those who appealed to ancient sources of renewal, leaping over a millennium of meantime to do so. In other words, you don't, nobody talks about Middle Ages till they feel like we're modern 
And there's an ancient world, and then there's these middle sort of dark ages that separate us moderns from the ancient world. And in the age of the Enlightenment, this spirit, this critical spirit, ran away from its ecclesiastical home as historicism and evolutionary thought undermined the faith of many in traditionary knowledge, whether in scripture or the dogmatic history of the church. Western Europe's literati dared to think for themselves, as Immanuel Kant suggested. They distrusted the traditions of medieval Christendom, employed critical methods in the study of the Bible, and labored to advance upon the thinking of the past. Many thought that human knowledge and behavior were improving, and they hoped that human reason and scientific learning would enable them to overcome the worst of world history. The best known among them were free-thinking intellectuals in the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries. Spinoza, Voltaire, Locke, Hume, Kant, and Hegel. But many church leaders, too, became developmental thinkers, handing on the faith in more historical, progressive, and less authoritarian styles, and promoting new methods of listening to the Spirit. In the grand scheme of things, only a fraction of the people of God participated in this Western intellectual movement we call the Enlightenment, at least in the beginning. Many Christians live beyond the reach of European culture, and few, even in Europe, read the work of the elite. Most were still illiterate. Most of the Orthodox, for instance, carried on much as before. They continued to affirm the importance of perpetuating Orthodox, ancient tradition, and they championed the role of ancient practices in doing so, especially ascetic and devotional exercises. Tradition, wrote Metropolitan Philaret of Moscow in the 18th century, does not consist uniquely in visible and verbal transmissions of the teachings, the rules, institutions, and rites. It is at the same time an invisible and actual communication of grace and sanctification. These priorities were detailed in the Philokalia of 1782, an orthodox compendium of texts by spiritual masters of the Hesychus tradition of prayer without ceasing as a means to union with God. Compiled by the brothers of Mount Athos in Greece, mainly Nicodemus the Hagirite and Marcarius of Corinth, it facilitated an ancient manner of Christian prayer and piety lost to the philosophes of early modern Europe, made famous in an anonymous Russian novel, The Way of the Pilgrim, published in 1884. But modern ways of thinking did filter through the church, slowly but surely, drip by drip, in the West and its colonies. And mainstream Christians began to reconceive tradition, not so much as a deposit that's meant to be preserved, as an ongoing process of clarifying and explicating apostolic teaching with assistance from believers outside of the church hierarchy. John Henry Newman, a convert to and cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, is the best known symbol of this modern transformation. In his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, published as he was converting to Catholicism in 1845, Newman suggested that the teaching of the church has improved over time and that her doctrine glows, grows clearer and more detailed with age. Time is necessary, he wrote, for the full comprehension and perfection of great ideas. Especially with respect to church teaching, he emphasized, the highest and most wonderful truths, though communicated to the world once for all by inspired teachers, could not be comprehended all at once by the recipients. But as being received and transmitted by minds not inspired and through media which were human, have required only the longer time and deeper thought for their full elucidation. Newman drove this point home with a now famous metaphor. It is indeed sometimes said that the stream is clearest near the spring, he admitted. Nonetheless, this image does not apply to the history of a philosophy or belief, which on the contrary is more equable and purer and stronger 
When its bed, he's still thinking about a river and a riverbed here, when its bed has become deep and broad and full, it necessarily rises out of an existing state of things and for a time savors of the soil. Its vital element needs disengaging from what is foreign and temporary. Its beginnings are no measure of its capabilities, nor of its scope. From time to time, it makes essays which fail and are in consequence abandoned. In time, it enters upon strange territory. Points of controversy alter their bearing. Parties rise and fall around it. Dangers and hopes appear in new relations. And old principles reappear under new forms. It changes with them in order to remain the same. This is a sort of uniquely modern developmental paradox. It changes to remain the same. In a higher world, it's otherwise. But here below, to live is to change. And to be perfect is to have changed often, unquote. Newman was not a relativist, nor a leveler, nor a liberal. He submitted to the papacy and served as a cardinal. He studied church history, though, especially the fourth century Trinitarian debates. And he knew that in the past, the heat of controversy had often helped to purify and clarify the teaching of the church. He also knew the magisterium had made some big mistakes and that in seasons of confusion, such as the fourth century, when the magisterium made a whole bunch of big mistakes with respect to the doctrine of the Trinity, in seasons of confusion, the religion of the faithful kept the church on course. In On Consulting the Faithful in Matters of Doctrine, another book of Newman's, 1859, he contended that the piety of Christians is one of the witnesses to the fact of the tradition of revealed doctrine. Their consensus, furthermore, when the going gets tough, is the voice of the infallible church. The teaching office is more happy, he appended in a hint to his fellow bishops, when she has such enthusiastic partisans about her than when she cuts off the faithful from the study of her divine doctrines and the sympathy of her divine contemplations and requires from them an implicit faith in her word, in their word, which in the educated classes will terminate in indifference and in the poorer classes will terminate in superstition. Conservatives in Rome viewed Newman with suspicion. For as Jacques Bossuet, Bishop of Meaux, had put it for them, most notably in his History of the Variations of the Protestant Churches, which was an anti-Protestant polemic, published in 1688. Catholic teaching is always the same. Semper idem became a slogan for some of these Catholics in this period of time. And that's what made it better than Protestant teaching, according to some of these Catholics. Because Protestant teaching, at least in their arguments, was always stable, was always the same. That's what gives it its authority. It's traditional, it's historic, it's reliable. Developmental thinking, furthermore, had paved a way not just for doctrinal diversity, but modernism and liberalism. And some Catholic thinkers later radicalized a Newmanesque notion of tradition, undercutting age-old doctrines in the process. The French priest Alfred Loisy and the Irish Catholic convert and Jesuit father George Terrell, both well-known academics, were removed from the church for developmental views. The French philosopher Maurice Blondel, a married layman, would receive the last rites, but his History and Dogma, published in 1904, criticized both historicists and old-fashioned extrinsicists, by which word he meant apologists for static, inorganic church tradition, in favor of a theory of tradition as what he called vital reality, a living organism that evolves over time under the guidance of the Spirit and whose truth is verified in Christian practice or action. Many say that the anti-modernist statements of Pope Pius X, such as Lamentabili Sana, an encyclical published in 1907, and Pascendi Dominici Gregis, another encyclical published in 1907, were meant to assail Blondel. He's not mentioned, but his views are criticized. For perhaps most importantly, officials at Vatican I had banned progressive views of doctrine <clears throat> in no uncertain terms. 
That meaning of the sacred dogmas is ever to be maintained, they insisted quite clearly, which has once been declared by Holy Mother Church. And there must never be any abandonment of this sense under the pretext or in the name of a more profound understanding. Further, if anyone says that it's possible that at some time, given the advancement of knowledge, a sense may be assigned to the dogmas propounded by the church, which is different from that which the church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. We're going to see tomorrow that Catholics wind up at Vatican II and thereafter siding with Newman, becoming very developmental. But in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they resisted this developmental way of thinking about the history of doctrine. Not just left-leaning Catholics, but even the most conservative Protestants were subject to this ruling of the, the Vatican Council. For the latter, Protestants place scripture over creeds, confessions, and other forms of tradition, historicizing them all, and thus continuing to transform their church's teaching ministries. The ones in universities advocated the value of independent, critical thinking, improving on the past by means of humanistic scholarship. Those in congregations or in new modern seminaries perpetuated their church's own confessional traditions, but they often criticized other churches as they did so, a practice then very common in every major branch of Christendom, attempting to revise the larger, small-c Catholic tradition. Philip Schaff, for example, perhaps the best-known Protestant at work in the churches to address these issues during the 19th century, valorized tradition more than many of his peers. He believed that it was pulsing well past the Church of Rome, though, ascending to a higher evangelical Catholic, as he called it, future. After moving from Berlin to accept a teaching post at a German Reformed seminary in central Pennsylvania, he released a short treatise titled, What is Church History? A Vindication of the Idea of Historical Development. This was in 1846. Appearing at first like his Catholic colleague Newman. So precisely as the single Christian does not become, a com- does not become complete at a stroke, he contended, but only by degrees, The church, as the complex of all Christians, must admit and require, to a gradual development. This process is organic. Organic was a very popular word in the 19th century West. This process is organic, Schaff echoed Newman further. Christianity is a new creation that unfolds itself continually, more and more from within. Not content with a Rome-bound theory of tradition, though, Schaff claimed the mainstream of his Catholic river— although formed first by the Greek Roman Universal Church, had wended through Romano-Germanic Catholicism, only to flow more recently in evangelical Protestantism. A passionate ecumenist, Schaff proved friendlier to those in other churches than the bulk of his contemporaries. Most 19th century Protestants were stoutly anti-Catholic, using scripture and tradition not simply to surpass but tear down much of the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Charles Porterfield Crouth is a well-known example. Like Newman, Schaff, and others, Crouth adopted a developmental view of Christian doctrine. In his massive work on the conservative Reformation and its theology, which he published in 1871, he explained that the identity of the church faith resembles not the sameness of a rock but rather the living identity of a man. The babe and the adult are identical, he underlined, to stress continuity in Protestant theology. They're the same being in different stages of maturity. That which constitutes the individual does not change. Adult perfection is reached not by amputations and engraftings, but by growth in which the identifying energy conforms everything to its own nature. The faith of the church now is identical with what it was in the apostolic time, but the relation of identity does not preclude growth. It only excludes change of identity. In a word, the advances are wrought not by change in the church faith, 
but by the perpetual activity of that faith, a faith which, because it is incapable of change itself, assimilates more and more to it the consciousness of the church, her system of doctrine, her language, and her life, unquote. And Krauth was a very conservative Lutheran in the late 19th century. So doctrine grows without change, a paradox resembling the argument of Newman. Krauth clarified, however, that as the faith grew, it also outgrew the many errors of the Roman Catholic Church, escaping from the Babylon of late medieval blight. During the Protestant Reformation, quote, the fire of the divine word destroyed the accumulated rubbish of tradition, swept away the hay, wood, and stubble, which the hand of man had gathered on the foundation and heaped over the temple, and the gold, silver, and precious stones of the true house of God appeared. This can sound harsh today, but it was commonplace among the most early modern Protestants. And as 19th century Catholic leaders grew, their Mariology, codifying the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary in 1854, and strengthened their commitment to the Pope's jurisdiction, codifying the doctrine of papal infallibility in 1870, this anti-Catholic tendency increased. The most important Protestant thinker to write about these issues for 20th century readers, and by important here I mean influential, especially among intellectuals, was the Swiss Reformed churchman and professor Karl Barth. In his Church Dogmatics, published from the 30s to the 60s, Barth took on board a progressive view of doctrine. But in struggling against the modern domestication of God and his word by his liberal predecessors who'd only speak of God from below on the basis of experience and consciousness, Barth insisted on the power and priority of Scripture over all other rivals, including church tradition. So he certainly didn't have our doctrine of Scripture, but uh, in the face of Catholic growth and liberal Protestantism, he did emphasize the priority of Scripture over tradition and over the church. The present-day witnesses of the Word of God can and should look back to the witnesses of the same Word who preceded them, he granted right away. These fathers and brethren have a definite authority, the authority of prior witnesses who have to be respected. But the weight of their tradition and the authority of the church must never be confused with the authority of Scripture. The Word of God is given to the church in such a way that it's always His Word against its Word. Underneath the Word of God, the church does have authority. She exercises it, though, in obedience to the Word by claiming for herself not a direct but only immediate authority. Not a material, but a formal, not an absolute, but a relative authority. Hence what we know as dogma is in principle fallible. I'm still quoting Bart here. And is therefore neither final nor unalterable, he claimed. Every church confession can be regarded only as a stage on a road which as such can be relativized and succeeded by a further stage in the form of an altered confession. This argument was not just academic for Barth. In the face of German Christians who accommodated the faith to the Nazi regime, he had helped in the drafting of the Barman Declaration of 1934, a new church confession that improved Christian witness to the Lordship of Christ over all earthly powers. By the early 20th century then, the differences among Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant understandings of the relationship of Scripture and tradition had become deeply entrenched. The modern ecumenical movement had just begun to take flight, but massive differences remained about the nature of and best ways to teach the Christian faith. Would the church's leading teachers find a better way forward? How do we get from trench warfare in the early 20th century to the much more ironic sort of engagement on our questions we've come to know more recently. These are the questions that we will take up tomorrow. So please come on back. Shall we close in prayer? Our Lord, a lot of information again, a lot of history we're covering here, uh, a lot of debates 
uh, that we're summarizing between Catholics and Protestants especially, but also Orthodox people. We pray again, Lord, that you would help us to learn what you would have us to learn, both so that we can be credible and fruitful um, ministers of your word and defenders of the scripture principle, and also people uh, who learn in the best possible ways how to use church history in our ministries, uh, even in the ministries of the word. Uh, Lord, go with us today as we leave this place. Guide us by your spirit. Uh, help us to be faithful to your gospel and your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.